You're listening to Talking About the Blues Talk Radio, streaming live on MDO Radio Blues. What's going on, good folks? Once again, you are bluesing on Talking About the Blues podcast, the number one blues podcast coming out of New York City and on MDO Radio Blues. All right now. And my guest today, legendary, very, very honor. It's an honor to me. I was able to see this gentleman play a 12-string guitar at the Lead Belly Fest at Carnegie Hall. Mr. Guy Davis, how are you, sir? I'm doing okay, my friend. Groovy, groovy. Now, we I, I don't even know where to start, and that's unusual for me because you have a, a history in the arts as well as in the blues. So I guess we could start with your blues journey. How did you meet the blues? What, Besides the fact that we're African-American, but what made you say, you know what, I, I have to play this? Well, let me tell you a little bit about me uh, getting involved in the blues. When I was about eight years old, I went to a summer camp run by Pete Seeger's brother. Uh, and at this summer camp, I heard a lot of folk music. And Pete Seeger was one of the white friends of Lead Belly, who uh, you might have spoken of just a few moments ago. And we used to hear songs by Lead Belly, including Good Night Irene. But there was this one song they did. It wasn't about Lead Belly, but sometimes they put his name in it. Uh, I think the song was called Lost John. Mm. And they Now, if you know anything about Lead Belly, you know that he sang his way out of prison twice. Yes. Once with Governor O.K. Allen, once with Governor Pat Neff. Uh, his talent got him out of there, even from a, a murder charge. Well, in this particular song, they talk about this man running from the bloodhounds and from uh, people uh, you know, chasing him with guns, trying to get him back to the chain gang. And they, and they used to call him uh, Lead Belly in the, when we did it in camp. And they said he had a special pair of shoes with a heel in the front and a heel in the back so that the dogs couldn't tell which way he was running. <laughs> and, man, I, I was all over that. The story is what drew me. But then hearing the 12-string guitar, at the time, me being eight years old, I couldn't play anything. So I would just, like, dance around and fall over the furniture. Cause <laughs> it, just was, it, was, it just got in my bones. So that was some of my introduction to uh, maybe not the blues as people know it, you know, like the Chicago sound of the blues, but the early, early blues that had to do with prison and had to do with missing your woman and going far away from home to find work and maybe send for your people. That's kind of what started me in the blues. Wow. It took me many years before I picked up a guitar uh, or a banjo and stuff. Um, but those days before I was 10 years old at that summer camp are what kind of turned my head. Wow. So now with, with the style of blues, the traditional music you play, the, the ragtime, the blue, the old Delta blues, the Piedmont and, and banjo folk blues, what would be your thoughts on today's more popular blues, I guess, of, of, of the last 30 years. My thoughts on the uh, more popular blues of today, these uh, latest sounding blues that you get from people like Chris Thomas King. Right. Um, well, I'm excited by them uh, for a couple of reasons. One is it shows uh, some evolution going into the blues. Uh, two, it makes me listen to old music through new ears. Mm. And three, I'm thinking that uh, there are people who are going to be turned on, younger people who will be turned on to the new sound of the blues and hopefully look back into the, you know, where it came from. Mm. Mm. I, I, I agree. I agree. Now, my question to you would be, do you find that there's a disconnect between the younger 
African American or art um audience and the blue well not when I say younger, I don't mean kids of today, but I mean uh post post Motown. Right. No, is there a disconnect between them and the blues? I don't know that there is a a disconnect between uh, the post Motown generation and the blues. I do know that ever since the 60s, when the civil rights era, era uh, started to gain ground, uh, the blues has not been as popular amongst the black folks as, say, gospel music or music that could rouse us and pull us together politically. Mm. And that when B.B. King was playing, say, back in the 60s, larger and larger white audiences were getting involved. In the early 60s, the folk blues was coming back, and B.B. King in the later 60s was bringing it on television. Now, the black audiences, when I started out, let's just say professionally in the blues, that would be uh, uh, 20 or so years ago, more than 20 years ago, it was rare to see a black face in the audience wherever I was playing in this whole world. Wow. And if one little black face appeared in the back of the auditorium somewhere, that was cause to celebrate, you know, get my little secret celebration on. <laughs> I would never give a white audience any less than I gave a black audience. But when I saw a black person come in, it's as if there was like a little secret brotherhood going on there. <laughs> um, yeah. But <clears throat> when um, I have found that over the years, more and more black folks are starting to come back and they're beginning to bring their kids and I'm beginning to see some college age black folks in the audiences now. Not a whole lot, but more than there used to be. So it's a moving equation here. I don't think it's uh, fair to say that there's quote unquote a disconnect as much as there is some reconnecting going on mm. Mm. I, I dig that I, I dig that and now you come from a activism background per, per se based on your parents they, they were highly active in in the movement as well as in art such as yourself now, and now I asked I, I bring this up because you you brought up a point that I never thought of and um I don't think it's ever been mentioned one of the, because I'm, I'm a big firm believer that the blues kind of took a slide to the, to the, a, a step to the side because a lot of progressive black folk did not want to recall. But you said that the music that became more popular was because it was kind of the soundtrack to the civil rights movement. I never thought of it that way. Uh, well, yeah. Now, you listen to Motown. You listen to James Brown, I'm Black and I'm Proud. Yes, that was a kind of a, and I'm glad you put it that way, a soundtrack to the civil rights movement. Um, I must agree with what you first said, that I think black folks started putting a little distance between themselves and the old-time blues and banjo music and stuff because it harkens back to slave times it harkens back to minstrelsy, where uh, not only did white folks paint their faces black so that they could uh, do coon music, but black folks, in order to make a living, had to paint their faces black to imitate what white folks were doing. So mm. it, it, uh, <laughs> it all gets a little bit squirrely. Right. Um, black folks are forward-looking people. I, I believe, listening to you, I noticed you agree with me. I think their forward-lookingness causes them to uh, put something down or put some things to the side so that they can step forward. But now, perhaps enough distance and time has gone by so that uh, more and more black folks will come back and see uh, black performance in particular uh, performing the old blues and also banjo music, which I do, uh, because it is part of our history and there are less and less people alive in the world today who have witnessed firsthand 
some of the tremendous cruelty and segregation and ways of the world that brought about the blues. And I'm not saying it's over. Right. You know, John Lewis is still here. Uh, Jesse Jackson is still here. These guys have seen that stuff. But I think that we're um, getting, we're moving around in terms of our own healing process. There's a lot of things that have to be dealt with. Uh, they involve the blues, but maybe the blues is not the whole of it. Mm. For instance, all the, uh, the Uncle Toms, all the coons, all the people who had to step and fetch it, the people who had to uh, put on a show so that the white folks would laugh and, um, you know, let us go for another day. Right. I think that uh, us, we as black folks have to find a way to re-include them mm. and forgive them as part of our evolution and growth as people. Because if we had all shown an angry face to the white man or to the oppressors, to those who kept black folks down, well, man, we so easy to identify. We could have all been killed. Wow. We could have all been wiped out. You think the Native Americans got it bad? And they'd have had Negroes because on reservations and they could all have to look at who we could have So somebody had to be able to get us through. And it was some of that energy. It was some of, um, you know, thank God for women, black women, yes. uh, stepping in to take up the slack. I know that. Um, Black men have uh, sometimes blamed uh, women for not letting them be men. And the whole process did not start out like that. Mm. Sometimes the women had to take the reins because that was the only way a black family was going to survive. And it was just a sad side effect that uh, black men kept slipping down the slope. But now we've got some more generations of people and the possibility of turning around. We've got a black president, which does not heal all the ills and uh, the hurt and harm and the danger, but it's a step, man. Like it, it's two steps. It is. It is. And and I'm happy you you started that statement by saying we also have to forgive our each other and ourselves and those in our communities who had to make hard decisions because I you know one of my favorite entertainers ever is Sammy Davis Jr. And um, my wife mentioned how, you know, his, his, a couple of pictures we came across and he wasn't looking too happy, even though he was smiling. And I was like, wow, you know, and all I could think of was what he had to actually put up with. I didn't think he would, he may have been successful uh, uh, in terms of popularity, but I don't think he was a happy dude. Uh, so with, with that being said, he, he doesn't fall into line of a, a coon or someone who shucks and jives, but he had to endure the same things the step and fetch it, step and fetch it's had to. Uh, you know how, what? What's your thoughts on that? Because if, if if I may, and if you don't mind, I would like to introduce to the audience who your parents are, because they played a a huge role in in. I mean, not just activism for in, in terms of social and financial and civil injustices, but allowing uh, 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 filmmakers and actors and, and, and theater folk to have an opportunity. Can I bring that up? Yeah, please do. Yeah, so the Honorable Ruby D. and, and Ozzy Davis... I, actually, before we get into the deep conversation about about growing up with them, how was it? How, what what I, I, you've already expressed based on your introduction to the blues that it was a very cultured upbringing. But do, could you explain some more about your upbringing uh, as a young as a young lad with Ruby D and Ozzy Davis? Ossie Davis and Ruby D were two people who I called mom and dad. And um, <clears throat> my sisters and I grew up in a household where we were expected to do 
same things that other kids in other households did. We went to public school. We were expected to come home with good grades. We were taught that we were as good as anybody, and this is very much in the age of integration. Mm. Um, my folks, I have to call them cultural ambassadors. Mm. I would we have to agree. Up, say what? I said I would have to agree. Okay. Yeah, I, we grew up um, in a family where you sat together at the supper table, and each of us got to talk about what we did with our day, questions we had, answers we had, whatever. We got to sit there. And we, my sisters and I would hear the names of people like Paul Robeson, W.E.B. Du Bois, Dr. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Huey Newton, Bobby Seale. We would hear these names and discuss them. And my folks would tell me uh, what was going on in the world. And I got to meet some of these people. Uh, I'm not going to speak linearly. I have to kind of speak as I'm feeling it here. Understood. The name Paul Robeson was very important to my parents. Here was a black man, a world traveler, a highly cultured human being who was a historian as well as an actor and a world-renowned singer. He was busted by the HUAC, the House on American Activity Committee, Senator Joe McCarthy, to say that he was a communist. He never actually was a communist, but he was a man who allowed himself to think along the lines that were comfortable for him. And he spoke his mind. He exercised his right as an American. Now, there was another man whose name didn't get spoken as much. Oh, and of course we heard names like Harry Belafonte, Sidney Poitier, and a lot of people you hear now. Right. But there was another man named Josh White, mm, yes. who was a blues man in the early days, and then he got to being what they call a folk singer in the uh, 50s and the 60s. And Josh got called in front of the House on American Activities Committee. Mm. And they said to him, basically, you have to name names or you will never work again. Wow. And um, Josh was not perhaps cut from the same cloth as Paul Robeson, but in his own way he was. He saw his own father beaten almost to death in front of his eyes by a white man when he was a kid came up in a very, very hard way. And here he was, up in front of the U.S. government, being asked to uh, say, is he now, was he ever a communist? Did he know any communist names? And um, black folks were counting on him to stand strong, like Paul Robeson, who said he wasn't naming nothing. Mm. That you want names, and go look up a name, baby, because I ain't giving it. Paul Robeson stood up like that. But Josh, who knew Paul, had to go before the committee, and I think it was the night before he went to Paul Robeson's house. He sat there and he looked Paul in the eye and he says, I'm going to give them your name. Wow. And Paul said to Josh, okay, you have to do what you have to do. I don't think that, I don't know for a fact, but I don't think that Paul, uh, turned his back on Josh. He saw that Josh was in a very hard circumstance, and there are people who today do not forgive Josh. But uh, this goes back to that uh, that uh, legend of Robert Johnson, the blues man who they said went down to the crossroads to meet the devil mm-hmm. and uh, get the ability to play the blues by making a deal with the devil. Well... If my father were alive, I'm sure he might say something along the lines of, you probably have not met a black person in America who has not had to make a deal with that. Wow. You probably have not met that person. So um, this uh, goes back into the area of uh, 
forgiveness that we were talking about. Yes. And other people we talked about at the supper table. Of course, that would include Sammy Davis Jr. I actually got to see him with my own eyes when I was a kid. I saw him on stage um, on Broadway. And then once he came out to New Rochelle to speak, there was a civil rights... I, I can't remember ex- what the exact occasion was, but there was something that had to do with uh, housing and people having rights and, uh, you know, black folks needing to stand together. And he came up to New Rochelle, New York, where we lived, and they built a stage out into the street on uh, Lockwood Avenue. Mm. And amongst the people who spoke was Sammy Davis Jr. I don't remember him singing or entertaining. All I remember is when he came off the stage, I was standing along the ramp that leads up to the stage in the back of the stage. It's where everybody could see. Right. And when he came off that stage and walked by me, that was about the most electricity I've ever felt come off of a human being in my life. Wow. I mean, of all the people I've seen, and I've seen Sidney Bonte, I've seen Shari Belafonte, that Paul Newman, you know, kinds of folks. And um, so we were talking about Sammy a little earlier, and his pals like Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and all those guys, and he used to seem like he kind of knuckled down under those guys. But my God, I got the feeling he had more talent in his little finger. Wow. All those cats put together. And yet somehow, due to the upbringing he had, uh, where he was brought up very much during the time of the step and fed to, to the coons, and so he was very aware of that kind of stuff. Um, but he was not allowed to flourish easily as a man. Mm. Not just a man who could just stand up and breathe and know who he is and feel confident in himself. Um, I know that this goes far beyond the question that you were asking me, but um, I think that the blues, I think that black folks sitting together and talking, I think that our culture is about a movement that we all make together. And some of us are at the far end of the movement. Some of us are at the front end. Some of us are right in the middle. We have to try to bring all of us. Mm. Our history is one history, even if it's ugly, even if it's tortured, even if it's wretched, even if it looks like there's nothing other than what they call the N-word. Right. Nothing other than niggers. We got to try to bring all of us. So when I sat around the table with my family, I was hearing about all these things. Mm. And we talked about everything. And I hope somewhere in that long speech I just gave that I answered your question. <laughs> no, you sure did. I, I mean, I, I'm just soaking it all up just the way the audience should be if they're not, because what you just did was lay down historical facts and, and geez, Heavy is heavy. I I, I want to go to a song of yours. I, I would like because it it came to my mind as you were sharing that black man blues. Uh-huh. What, what, what is this the inspiration? Everything you just shared with us. So how about you tell us what the inf- inspiration and not let me answer the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> black man's blues. Uh- never actually got to be a full-fledged song as much as it was an interlude in the midst of a play. And I sing that song, I was down on the bottom, couldn't tell east from west, bloodhounds chasing after me, I couldn't get no rest. I sing that little interlude right at the end of a story I tell about the character I was playing, witnessing a lynching. Mm. I talk in detail about that lynching and how they strung this young boy up in a tree. And I looked at him. He only had one shoe on. And uh, Mm -hmm. how after he'd been hung, there was a church bell ringing and the black folks in the community came out and they cut him down. They took him away. And how my character 
walked over to uh, right where that boy had been hung and looked on the ground in the mud. And he saw what turned out to be the boy's other shoe. Mm. The character picked up that shoe. And probably the boy's glad. Oh, that just looked like this. I handed it to her. Well, that song was just a musical interlude that takes me out of that deep and heavy story. Um, and it was something that gives the audience a breath, just a moment to digest the story before I go on to another story um, that had to do with um, racial injustice. Mm. Uh, but the, <laughs> the next story I tell actually is a humorous story, but so it, it, it still focuses on the fear that a black man feels, but the story was humorous. So after the audience gets that interlude to digest, then they get a moment to laugh. Right. So that they can kind of pull themselves back up out of their story. The song I wrote, Black Man's Blues, was just a title I gave to that minor interlude. It's only got two verses to it. Uh, I guess they are important verses. I never thought of the song as standing on its own. Mm. But in a way, it does. In a way, it does. It, it, it sure does. <laughs> you know, so now let's talk about your acting. So it sound, was, was this a one-person play that we're discussing? Yes, it is. The play is called The Adventures of Fishy Waters in Bed with the Blues. Mm. And uh, there is a black man who has been a hobo, and he gets to come out in front of the audience and treat them as if they are uh, sitting around on a back porch, you know, sipping a little corn, but eating some, uh, you know, lemonade, uh, cookies and drinking some lemonade. And um, he gets to tell them uh, stories about his days on the road as a hobo. And a lot of the stories are just tall tales about giant mosquitoes and stuff like that. <laughs> or uh, silly stories, funny stories. But that's just, as a, as a writer, um, I kind of designed it that way just to sort of break the audience up a little and shake up their expectations, allow them to relax. And then uh, I do tell them the lynching story, which is something that is very low and gets very quiet in the audience. And then I bring it back to some humor. And then uh, the character, Fishy Waters, gets to tell the story of how he left home, wandered into a hobo camp, and how he first got his name, Fishy Waters, and how he winds up diverting from his ambition, which was to go to Nashville or Memphis, because one of those hobos convinces him to go to Chicago. Mm. Up there, where uh, the blues is made out on Maxwell Street, that kind of thing. So... um that's just the rough course and theme of the play. It is a collection of stories and music. And uh, I think almost everybody likes a good story. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, would, would you say that's what makes the blues and folk music pretty much the same? The, the story of the, the uh, press? Yeah, I, yeah, I have to say that. Uh, stories are what uh, make the blues, folk music, and not just black folk music, but all sorts of folk music, uh, makes it so much the same. Hmm. So now, what inspired this, this, this play, and how long is it? Is it still on the road? Let's talk about the play. Okay, the play lasts roughly an hour, a little less than an hour and a half if he did it end to end. But it has been produced also as a two-act play. It has been done in humble circumstances such as a, cafe, a student cafeteria. It has been done uh, sitting still in front of a microphone with some guitars around me. It has been done full out in a theater with slides projected uh, on uh, a screen and a set that included uh, a boxcar of a train. Um, it's been done in Australia. 
I've done it out in Oakland, California. I've done it up in Canada, over in uh, England. So uh, it, it doesn't have a regular uh, life. But I would say it, just about every year I get to do it, um, you know, maybe a couple of times. That's groovy. I'm just going to say roughly a couple of times every year. That's groovy. Um, and it's, I, don't know, I think I wrote it. I was really inspired by my father, who uh, thought of himself as a writer, though he is known so much more, I suppose, as an actor. He thought of himself as a writer. Mm. Let me tell you a little about my dad. I remember coming home nights when I was in my early 20s. What is uh, I should say coming home in the wee hours. I might, you know, get home like five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and I would walk into, uh, instead of going straight upstairs, I might go in the kitchen. And my father would be over in the dining room, sitting at the dining room table in his robe. And in front of him, was it? Uh, he'd have two yellow legal pads. He would have this Quaker oatmeal box that was empty with part of the side cut down. In that box were several number two pencils, erasers, pieces of scotch tape. And he would take, he, he had a piece of scotch tape wrapped around his right pinky knuckle. And the purpose of that was um, to keep his finger from scuffing the graphite as he wrote. Mm. And uh, he never told me anything about it. He would just be up there writing. And uh, just roughly almost every morning. We, and um, I don't know how it came about, because my dad wasn't one to lecture. But he told me one morning that, uh, yeah, I guess I was curious about why he was there every morning doing this. And, uh, I mean, I knew he was writing, but, uh, well, you know, why every morning, every morning? Uh, he said something like, talent is a mighty fine thing. But skill or craft, the craft of being a writer, means you have to do it whether you feel like it or not. Mm. And uh, I learned more from him just by watching him every day. And I ever learned by he or my mother lecture, give me a long ass lecture about you got to do this and you got to do that. You got to dress like this. You got to say that. So I just watched. So I learned so much. So when it comes to being a writer, I've applied what my dad said to my playwriting, also to my songwriting. And I'm working on it. I continue to work on my craft. Mm. That's a gift my dad gave. That's serious. That's very serious. That's very groovy. I hope you guys are paying attention because you are getting, so you're being taken to school right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's very serious. So now, so are you into uh, movies? Would you like to be in movies or it's pretty much, if it comes along, that's cool, but this is where I'm at with it. Uh, I'm not sure what you said about school. Oh, no, 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 no. I was telling the audience they're being taken to school. I'm asking oh, you. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Sorry. It's okay. I'm still have fun. <laughs> I'm still dealing with the weird sound equipment. Um, films, yes, I'm interested in. I continue to be interested in films. Um, uh, including uh, Beat Street from uh, 1984. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you, you were in Beat Street? Yeah, I played Double K back when I was a young, lean, handsome cat with uh, his hair. Wow. My eyes and a pretty smile. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm actually ashamed that I didn't know you were Double K. That was what, I, you know, I'm a bluesman, but I started in, obviously my, well not obviously, but in my generation, hip hop was big in in my my home and with my siblings and cousins, and Beat Street is like a, 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 the go-to cult movie 
of and I just I'm actually I'm ashamed I didn't know that was you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, there's no need to be ashamed. As a matter of fact, I've kept my life pretty compartmentalized. Uh, people are often surprised that uh, about my theater and film background. Uh, I haven't been in a lot of movies. I used to also be on a you know, soap opera, One Life to Live. Mm. Be back in the eighties. Uh, same same species in the 80s. Um, I, at some point or other, have belonged to approximately five theaters in New York City, most of them up in Harlem. Mm. Uh, so, in a way, it was like retracing a lot of my parents' uh, footsteps. They met in the theater in, the, in and around New York City. So, um, I think I come by a lot of what's in me, honestly. Hmm. How, you know, I have to ask you this because talking about the blues actually started for me when um, I had to bury, when we had to bury my, my father and my grandfather in the South. And coming back to New York, I mean, I traveled back and forth a lot as a child, but I didn't understand what was being infused in me until when I got older, about 28, and came back. And uh, my wife, I think we were married at the time, or uh, but we were together. Either way, why why are you listening to old Negro spirituals and the blues? Was her her question? Because we we sat down for like four or five hours just listening to this, and that kind of spawned this journey retracing my family steps and things of this nature. I bring that up because I would like to ask you, was it therapeutic? Did it help your art? What, what did you get and how did it help or affect you as you retraced your parents' steps in your journey? As I retraced my parents' steps, Right. Well, you you said that you kind of you, you kind of retraced their steps as you took this acting journey through New York and in the in, in the theater community. So I was wondering how that affected you as an artist, as a person, your perspective. Good question. Um, I think I have not only retraced my some of my parents' journeys, and I continue to but also some of my grandparents' journeys. Mm. I think it was there to be done. The answer to this may lie in uh, realizing that when I first heard the blues, the very first time I heard it, that would be, um, I think it was some white college boys on a street corner or something like that. I didn't know at the moment that it was black folks music because I didn't hear the music in my home. Mm. Even when my grandmother lived there, and my grandmother, uh, I think, was born in South Carolina and had her roots down in Georgia and also Alabama. Well, I felt like this music, even when the white college boys were singing it, I felt like whatever it was it was singing, I felt something of it was already inside of me. Mm. I mean, on a, on a personal level, it felt like a key was being used to unlock something that was inside me. Uh, so I think I followed it because it was there. There was something subliminal, something that I didn't know, something that my parents did not instruct me about when it came to... Uh, the blues. Mm. Now, as far as acting was concerned, I used to get to be backstage when they were on stage. I used to see actors backstage when they were putting on their makeup and meet folks like that. And so, I guess that was a lot more present in my life, and I always did want to be up in front of people. I mean, uh, whether or not it was musical, I wanted to be in front of people. I wanted to be the center of attention. Mm. Probably the part of the reason I wrote... Uh, the Adventures of Fishy Waters in Bed with the Blues, my play, is uh, 
So I'd have all these stories mm-hmm. memorized. So I would just be everybody's favorite uncle and invited to uh, Thanksgiving uh, 52 weeks a year. You know, <laughs> so people want to hear me tell stories. I say, yeah, God, that's what I want to do. So um, I think it just started pulling itself together as I went along. And, uh, yeah, that first piece of drama, I was, I was telling you about that uh, song when it talked about the Ned Belly character running from the hounds with the with the shoes on that have uh, healings running in the back. I said, yeah, man, this is what I should be talking about. Mm. Crazy, wow, stuff like that. Mm. So um, I've learned a lot about my folks as I've gone along, and I find each and every little thing inspiring. I haven't necessarily learned it formally, I've learned some of it informally. Mm. Both my grandfathers were railroad men. My dad's dad was the head man on a team of track liners. Those cats would be hammering spikes and uh, lining track, you know, uh, pushing the crowbars onto the uh, track to get the mm. tracks lined up perfectly straight. And my other grandfather was a cook and a waiter on uh, one of the Pullman cars, like a Pullman porter, uh, right. the uh, trains that went, uh, I think, between New York and Chicago or Cleveland. You know, he used to be on that run. And as a matter of fact, um, we were just we've been cleaning out my mom's house to sell it, and my sisters found my mother's father's, my grandfather's gold watch. Wow! And they gave it to me. It didn't work, but I. Took it to a shop. It cost me a pretty penny, but I got this thing back working. Mm. And it's not like watches today. Like it's a, a pocket watch. Pocket watch or a wrist watch today has got a battery in it, so you just replace the batteries to keep working. This one you have to wind up every day. Wow! And it's got a special uh, way of winding it. And then there's another little latch you hit. The glass front opens up, so you can actually touch the hands of the watch. I believe a blind man could use this thing. Wow. I mean, it possibly was the kind of watch meant so that a blind person could use it. And then there's this tiny little pin that you have to use the tip of a knife to pull out. And it's like this, uh, I, it's hard to describe, like a little flat rod that comes out of the side of it so that you can re, uh, wind the knob and reset the uh, time. And then you have to push it back. It, it's intricate. It's very mechanical. It's very beautiful. But um, I'm working on stories about both these grandfathers. Wow. So, would, so yeah. did any of this, uh, of your grandparents, your grandfathers working on a railroad, did that inspire, I mean, inspire a railroad story? Uh, there's a railroad story, the, uh, the song that yes. I do? Yes. With the harmonica? Yes. Uh, well, I don't think... It did directly, you know. It was, um, I've always been fascinated by railroads and trains. Maybe that had something to do with my grandfather, but it wasn't so much my grandfather that um, got me interested in that. I used to listen to uh, Sonny Terry, the harmonica player. Yes. Who I've stolen so much from. <laughs> and I would hear him uh, make sounds on the on the harmonica that sounded like trains, sounded like dogs, sounded like cats, coyotes were. And um, I was fascinated by that. And and plus I get to include in that railroad story convicts escaping from the chain gang. Mm. So one of my, one of my uh, always, my go-to subjects. <laughs> and um, I, it didn't come so much from direct experience as it did from um, imagination okay. and the uh, kind of the thrill I get when I listen to Sonny Terry. Uh, interestingly enough, though, there is something that involves prison in my family. My father once opened up an encyclopedia or, or some kind of book from, what would it be, the 30s, maybe, uh, that came from... Probably, I guess it, maybe it was a, something about Georgia. I don't remember exactly what the book was about because we have lost this book. And he opened it up to a page, and then on that page you saw a black and white photograph of a line of convicts 
uh, at least about a dozen men standing. And it was shot from uh, slightly off to the side. And you could see down at the uh, most of it, all the convicts were basically facing front. Right. But um, there was one convict down at the far end, and he was leaning out looking at the camera. And my father said that he thought that that was my grandfather. Wow. He thought that that was his father. And it looked like him, too. It looked like pictures that I've seen of my grandfather, because my granddad did have it. He had to do time <laughs> at one point. Oh, they got it. They busted him for um, uh, being a, a root doctor. You know, go into the woods and cut roots and ginseng and boil it and turn it into these tonics and things like that. Mm. And uh, the white folks down in uh, Georgia were mad at him for also having a white man's job, which was the uh, uh, the railroad job. He had a uh, a flush toilet, which not everybody had down there, not even the white folks. Wow. So there were times when the Klan was after him. They sent a man to kill my grandfather. The white folks sent a black man to kill my grandfather. Wow. I got, to write, I, I got stories that have yet to be written about this, but I got one surviving uncle who helps me with it. And uh, so that uh, black man came around to my grandfather. He was really a big, tall man, well over six feet, just like my um, my grandfather was that big, plus the man they sent to kill him was that big. Mm. And the man they sent to kill him was the kind of man who uh, he would take hobos off of trains, knock them out, uh, and then they would wake up on a chain gang somewhere. And, uh, I think this story's getting a little convoluted. What I meant to just say was that my grandfather showed the man who came to kill him that he had a pistol, and he was not afraid to use it. Mm. So that man never did kill my grandpa. Yeah, he woke up. <laughs> he had a woke up call. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. He, he, he. Well, I, I'm. You know, the the story that you just shared, just it it that, and it goes back to your earlier statement of not just being able to discuss with the oppressing. Uh, uh, ethnicity or group of people, but the discussion and forgiveness of each other, right? Because uh, uh, obviously this brother's job was to find unsuspecting black folk and sell them to the chain gang, to the prison, the original prison industrial system. Yes, yes, exactly. That was that that whole play by August Wilson. Joe Turner's come and gone. Yeah. That's what it was. That thing. Jeez, that. Listen, okay, because I, I, I'm really intrigued, and I, I, I have to. We have to do this again. We, we have to do this again because you, you're a wealth of information that people need to. They have to understand. You know, they, they, they have to, our people as well as everybody who appreciates the music needs to understand this and i i find that there's a conflict on both sides of the playing field almost like the uh line of scrimmage in football where you you have some white folk who really appreciate the music and for the most part a, a great majority of them mean well but they're like oh forget about that that's you know that is just about the blues. The blues is the only color. It's music. Then you have black folk that, as well, majority mean well, but it's like it's more than the music. And I, I think that's where the um, the the this belongs to me, not you attitude or, or or way of thinking comes because the conversation you and I are having, most people don't want to address or hear this and it's necessary for healing and to be able to appreciate the music that everyone really celebrates it's actually more popular than pop music would you agree for me i would agree now um if you could discount the money factor <laughs> <laughs> if i could just fully and utterly agree but um 
there's a music industry, which um, is, I, I'm not sure how to characterize it. I could say it's crazy, it might be out of balance, but since it's designed to make money, um, that means somebody is purposefully trying to influence our tastes. Mm. So um, we have to, there's a lot, let's just say there's a lot of discussion to be had on it. I dig it. it. I mean, you know, we this is the platform for it. This is the platform for it. I have to say, uh, it, first and foremost, you know, I really enjoyed your performance. My wife and I was amazed. You, Dom, um, Tahimbe, uh, uh, I can't remember everybody, Walter Trout, for that matter. We enjoyed that entire performance. And I, was, I, I get really, really uh, mesmerized by 12 stars. 12 uh, string guitars. I don't play a 12 string and I'm a little bit apprehensive. I'm a little afraid of that. I just grab a slide, but it just seems so difficult. Is it much more difficult than the average guitar? A 12 string guitar, um, for me, I won't say it's more difficult, but the touch of a 12 string is different than the touch of a 6 string. Mm. Essentially, you're dealing with the same notes and the same chords, but a 12 string you might hit fewer chords because those strings are so big, they double. So um, it lends itself to rhythmic playing. Sometimes you get something that sounds like a train on a 12 string. You could do it on a six, but on a 12, man, it really rumbles. Mm. Um, Lead Belly had his 12 string tuned down so low. My God, it sounded like a storm coming. Um, Yes. It's a question of, well, comfort to some extent. I play using finger picks. Some people cannot stand finger picks. Some people play with flat picks. Some people use no picks. And on a six string, you can work all that out. But on a 12 string, it's not as easy to play it with just your naked finger. It really? can be done. But, uh, so it, it's a question of the touch of the instrument. Understood. So the touch for some folks might be a little more difficult or intimidating but uh it depends on the sound you want to come up with hmm, dig it dig it so now what's on the agenda what's next and where could the good people find you well uh essentially you're gonna have to go on my website guydavis.com <laughs> and look for where i'm playing next i will be out in uh california starting on the uh 21st through the 26th of this month. And then the next day, my son is going to fly out to join me, and the two of us are going to drive back across the United States of America. It'll be my first cross-country drive. Nice. Nice. It's, it's going to be just for us, some father-son time. It's very nice. And then as the uh, year progresses, I'll be uh, getting back over into Europe. And I think that's in Italy coming up. And so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm gonna be a busy cat, and I couldn't tell you where I'm gonna be unless I'm looking at it. On my calendar. <laughs> Understood. Understood. Hey, one last question that I, I would like to hear your thoughts on this digital era. Now you you're old school, so you remember the reels and analog, and vinyl and CD. What's your thoughts? What's your feel about this new? digital medium and direct to consumer my thoughts are even though there are some purists who might disagree with me i like i like the ease and convenience of recording digitally uh i think that the quality of the music is not hurt by the uh clarity that digital brings Mm. Plus, there's all sorts of sound effects and sneaky things you can put in there digitally. Um, and maybe it's even considered tricky. But to me, it is not dishonest as long as it glorifies the artist and his instrument and his voice. I'm not worried about the fact that it is not as pure as uh, what Thomas Edison came up with. <laughs> uh, understand, back when Thomas Edison came, you know, with, with the voice recorder, the phonograph, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. um, 
that was like amazing for its time. That's right. And I'm sure that people did not complain about what we call like a real muddy sound. Now, back then, it was everything. It was, it was a miracle. <laughs> so there's always going to be something clearer. Um, I do draw the line at those robots, I suppose Japanese or whatever country they come from, that can not only play music, but they can compose music. Right. I'm not interested in what a machine has to tell me. I'm not interested in scientists who are busy trying to imbue a piece of mechanical structure with a soul. Right. That's not where I'm at. Um, I do believe in the creativity of the human being in trying to find ways to survive and trying to find ways to make life easier, to progress, to evolve. That's all good. But uh, I am not in favor of us trying to replace ourselves, human beings, as creative. No, and I, I agree. We need to do what we do by our human nature. I don't think we need to be ruled by machines, have our tastes set by machines, our appetites, our desires. Mm -mm. Human beings. I agree. I agree. I agree. I, it, it was an honor and a pleasure, and we have to do this again. <laughs> yeah, I look forward to uh, speaking with you and seeing you um, within these, uh, just in the early part of uh, next month. Yes, sir. Absolutely. 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 Good folks. You've been listening to Talking About the Blues in a very, very, in, I would say intense, because we got some great historical information, not in retrospect as, in, as far as us discussing things that we read, but in retrospect as, in far, as, as far as the person actually being there and sharing this with us. This is very important, and this is the purpose of this platform. I want to thank our guest, Mr. Guy Davis. And as you all know, besides the fact that I'll be back next week, <laughs> keep God first and keep on blues. To hear archives of the Talking About the Blues podcast interviews, go to the Talking About the Blues YouTube channel. And while you're there, subscribe to that channel. Talking About the Blues podcast is hosted and produced by Lamont Jack Purley, production manager Denise Mrs. D. Purley, all rights reserved to Talking About the Blues.